the Public News Service Daily Newscast, November the 20th, 2020. I'm Mike Clifford. A partial recount of Wisconsin votes in the presidential race begins today. It comes amid repeated election fraud claims from President Trump despite those claims going unfounded. President Trump requested a ballot recount in Milwaukee and Dane counties, both of which are considered more liberal. Milwaukee County also is home to the state's largest number of black residents at nearly 27 percent. Greg Lewis of the group Souls to the Poll says after all the outreach work that was done in the middle of a pandemic, it's difficult to see a recount with such a narrow focus. It's very disrespectful for someone to come along and really cast a shadow and and cast doubt over where everything that that is done in this community has been legitimate. He says black Wisconsinites also had to overcome the state's restrictive voting laws. Milwaukee's Democratic mayor echoed the sentiments, calling the recount effort an attack on minorities. The Trump campaign paid a $3 million fee for the recount, while asserting that a number of absentee ballots in these counties were illegally altered and issued. I'm Mike Moen. The recounts must be completed by December 1st. President-elect Joe Biden won in Wisconsin by more than 20,000 votes. As policymakers gear up to write a state budget for the next two years, a new report has suggestions on how to expand health care coverage to more families in the state of Connecticut. Tiffany Donaldson is the CEO of the Connecticut Health Foundation. The group is 13% of the Connecticut population, but yet they represent 26% of those who are uninsured in our state. The group of people who are uninsured includes about 48,000 folks who make between $17,600 and $25,000 a year. With COVID cases rising again in New York, nurses in one of the early hotspots say conditions at their hospitals are unsafe and they're threatening a two-day strike on December the 1st. Nurses at Montefiore Hospital in New Rochelle have been negotiating for a contract for more than two years. At a rally outside the hospital on Thursday, nurses said they want wages that are up to regional standards and to hire more nurses to ensure adequate staffing levels, including in intensive care. Michelle Gonzalez, a nurse on the negotiating team, says it takes four months to train an ICU nurse, but hospital management only wants to train helpers. We are not asking for helpers. We have very clearly demanded that we need staff that is ICU trained and ICU prepared. I'm Andrea Sears reporting. Tomorrow is National Adoption Day, which celebrates forever families and highlights those kids still waiting to find homes. Throughout the month of November, Illinoisans are being encouraged to share their connections to adoption by displaying coloring sheets in their windows created with their kids and sharing pictures on social media. Allison Ketzenberg works in the Illinois Department of Child and Family Services Quincy Field Office. She says COVID-19 has definitely affected the ability to connect foster children with forever families. Some adoptions have been delayed because of COVID. Courthouses have been closed. Attorneys and people involved have been quarantined or positive for COVID. Foster families are a little more reserved. They don't want to expose their family. Tomorrow is National Adoption Day, when many courthouses around the state typically hold ceremonies celebrating the finalization of adoptions. Some of those events have been moved online. Mary Sherman reporting. The Gila and San Francisco rivers in southwest New Mexico have been central to the state's history and their designation as wild and scenic. The research shows water-related outdoor recreation in the area supports thousands of jobs, which provide $92 million of income. Grant County Commissioner Alicia Edwards has seen firsthand what the rivers provide. It stimulates activity that is responsible for 4,000 or more jobs in this area, and that is huge. And there are jobs that are probably primarily small businesses. The M.H. Dutch Salmon Greater Gila Wild and Scenic River Act is currently before the U.S. Senate. I'm Roz Brown. And finally, Diane Bernard tells us West Virginia is on track to meet requirements handed down by the Department of Justice last year to move more foster kids with mental health issues out of institutions 
in favor of community-based health care. Cammie Chapman with the state's Department of Health and Human Resources notes her agency is working with groups as part of the DOJ agreement to have no more than 712 foster children with serious emotional disorders in residential treatment facilities by the end of 2024. Chapman expects the state to reach that goal. As of October 31st, 2020, our number for kids that are in a residential mental health treatment facility that are foster care children placed in DHHR custody was 822. So we are on target. She points out the number of referrals of foster children has dropped during the COVID-19 crisis while schools are closed and acknowledges the number of children in institutions might rise when schools open again. I'm Diane Bernard. This is Mike Clifford for Public News Service, member and listener supported on interesting radio stations across the nation and viewed now on Free Speech TV.